do do a lot of speaking and go around to these sorts of events quite a bit. Typically, it's for maybe people that are a little bit less familiar with the challenge or the issues than maybe this crowd was. It's more of a lay person type of audience. But I think what what I had hoped for with the book that I wrote and these kinds of presentations are to to make to bring some of these issues to a little bit clearer understanding for the broader public and to, you know to make it clear that there are. <clears throat> There are a lot of challenges in our water situation. It's not just a simple. Uh, it's not just a simple matter. Water's not free. It takes a lot of money to collect and treat and store and distribute water. Um, and even if you consider that the water itself is free, there's you know billions and billions of dollars a year required in the infrastructure to to um, get that water to come out of your tap when you flip it on. And that's that's mostly what you know most of us think about is just does that water come out of the tap when I flip it on just sort of like does the light come on when I flip the switch on and it's not <clears throat> you know it's not nearly that simple so yeah I like to get around and talk to these these kind of groups to try to help raise some of these issues in terms of the innovation um, you know there's a lot of technological innovation going on in the industry today um, as I mentioned I don't think it's it's dangerous to think that technology is going to solve our water problems it can certainly help solve our water problems and there are kind of incremental changes going on around the edges of lots of different types of water technologies to make them more efficient um, and we're seeing a lot of new companies and new money coming into the industry to um, you know to address that challenge and address what they believe is a commercial opportunity that results from that challenge so I think we will see a lot of innovation in terms of local area here I mean uh, we were talking about the this shift from agricultural consumption to municipal consumption and and the, the difficulty or the sort of binary nature of that, you know, do I keep farming or do I or do I shut it down and collect my money on the water rights and move to Florida and buy a sailboat? Um, in a lot of ways it's been sort of a, a buy or dry is what you know what we say around here is, you know, should I should I continue to farm or should I um, you know sell out and take my money and run <clears throat> and there's a lot of innovations going on there's one little company here in the area that is focused on better um, management and um, uh, software capabilities to allow farmers to look at their water as basically one more commodity that they own or could sell so they can look at their kind of economic potential opportunities as you know I can raise livestock I can grow corn I can grow wheat or I can grow water and I by that, meaning that I can maybe sell a little bit of my water, at least a little bit of my water to the city of Fort Collins during a drought, rather than using it to irrigate one of my fields. So I'll produce a little bit less corn or a little less wheat this year, but I will gain, you know, $5,000 an acre foot for the water that I lease to Fort Collins or that I lease to this or that energy company out here on the plains. Uh, and so in terms of maximizing my overall economic situation, uh, maybe some years I'll use my water to grow crops, and some years I'll use my water to supply the city of Fort Collins, and kind of maximize my economic for my, you know, my cash flow. Does so, does that hurt the public though? Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, the obviously crops and and prices of food and things like that, is there an impact that way? Well, ultimately there would have to be, you know, from the perspective mm -hmm. of one farmer, you know, you're really dealing with a commodity there. So one guy deciding not to grow corn this year is probably not going to have an impact on the price of corn. But yeah, sure. I mean, longer term, I think that's what the fear has been: is that as water as water rates go higher and higher and higher, raw water prices go higher and higher and higher. We'll see more of this drying up of agricultural activity, and at some point, it'll start to have an impact on food prices. And so there's that there's again that balance that I mentioned about not being able to maximize all of your objectives at the same time. There's one way that you might operate if you were only thinking about water. There's another way that you might you know, set up your entire system or economy in an area if you were driven primarily by energy. And yet another if you're thinking only about food prices, perhaps. And so you kind of have to look at all those things in, in combination and, and kind of find a way of sub sub-optimizing each one of them, I think, is the solution long term. So anyway, from the point of, you know, from the perspective of innovation, there are some companies that are doing some pretty interesting things in terms of ag water consumption and ways of looking at it and systems to help farmers understand it better and frankly a lot of those a lot of that kind of thinking about irrigation and ag water consumption a lot of the thinking and innovation in that area is coming out of CSU and some of the people and expertise that's here I, mean, I think across the country I think <clears throat> CSU is viewed as being one of the you know certainly one of if not the 
leading you know, educational institution in terms of sort of agricultural irrigation issues.